In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. There are two ways that we get the saints dreadfully wrong. The first is to remove them from our own human reality, to place them in another category, as though they were some kind of different human being, perhaps part of a pantheon of heroes, superheroes, like Greek demigods, or perhaps like something from the Marvel or DC universe. We separate them from our ordinary reality and assume that somehow they were born different. They were born with some sort of extra capacity for holiness, for sanctity, for a life of devotion to God. And sure, it's great, isn't it, as Orthodox, we have them in our wider family. But that's enough. We can just be ordinary Christians, ordinary human beings, and let them do the work. Let them intercede for us. Let them do the heavy lifting in church life and mission. The second way that we separate the saints from us is in time and space. And oddly, in this way, by making them part of some other kind of circumstances, we actually assume the reverse of the first objection, which is to say, sure, it would be easy to be a saint if only these external circumstances were in play. If only I could have lived in a time when it was easy to get martyred just by refusing to put incense before an emperor, or when I, if ever I lived in a time when it was a holy Byzantium or a holy Russia or something like that. We place the saints in another time and place where the very fabric and tapestry of the world makes it easy to achieve sanctity. But neither of these ways that we get the saints wrong is at all helpful in our spiritual life. And so for that reason, the church gives us this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, the Sunday after All Saints, to commemorate the opposite of those two objections. To commemorate those saints who walked amidst us, who walked in our own land, who walked in our own time and place, the people that are known to those of us in the wider church family here in North America. Very many of these saints were known personally by people that we know. Their churches that they established are churches we can worship in. Even the, the very life of the church as we have it in North America is framed by their life. And so we walk together with them. The church gives us this celebration of the local saints precisely to show that saints are not different from us. They are ordinary men and women and children who simply devoted themselves fully to the Christian life. And nor were they living in some sort of special sanctified environment that made it easy to do what they achieved. Rather, they simply sacrificed themselves and their lives for the sake of the gospel. And we could take any one of the saints, the great many that we sang about at vigil last night, all throughout North America, the various ways that they served, the, the myriad of gifts that they showed to the church. But I would like us to home in this morning on just one amidst that great array of saints who shone forth here in North America. And she was born in 1916. She was born in a village called Kethluk, it's actually called a city, but at her, the time when she lived, it had only 250 people, and I looked yesterday, there are only 429 today. It's a very small village south of the Yukon Delta in western Alaska, some hundreds of miles west of Anchorage. And she was born amidst the, the, the Yupik people, people related to the Aleutians and to the Inuit. And she was baptized amongst the first of her people to be baptized as an infant, 
and given the name Olga, or Olinka, as she came to be known. Her name in Yupik is Arsanko. And she grew up in this small village, a small village that consisted of traditional Yupik dwellings, sort of mud huts that were semi-submerged, people who had for thousands of years been hunter-gatherers, gathering berries when they could, hunting reindeer for both meat and as a source of, of, um, of power for doing some li limited agriculture. She married, according to Yupik custom, in an arranged marriage at a young age to uh, another Yupik named Nikolai. And Nikolai was not a churchgoer, but Olga was. And Olga, with Nikolai, raised, well, gave, she gave birth to 13 children, only eight of whom survived into adulthood. Nikolai was a hunter, but then he settled down and became the first owner of the general store and post office in Ketru. Remember, this is only about 50 or 60 years after the U.S. purchase of Alaska, so things, the infrastructure was just getting established. And in the village, there were very few priests who were able to come. For a time, there had been Russian priests who had been there, even some Americans. But by this point, it was poorly served. Priests would only come from time to time. But Olga faithfully went to church. And she led readers' services. She learned all of the services of the church that she could off by heart. And when priests came, she was the one who baked phosphor. And she was the one who sewed the vestments for the priests and appointed the church. She made and decorated the church for the feast. In addition to that work, she was a midwife, not only looking after her own children, but she helped very many women in her village and beyond. There were about 12 villages in the smaller villages in the vicinity. And she traveled from place to place and helped women to go through their pregnancy and childbirth. And she was gifted with an ability to know even before women were able to detect themselves that they were pregnant. So she ensured that they had the very best of care from the first moment of their pregnancy. She also would go frequently to the local banya, or steam bath, because she found that there she was able to minister to women more intimately, more quietly, outside of the earshot of the men from the community and beyond. And she found a great many of them had been abused. A great many of them had borne the scars of child abuse and ongoing spousal abuse. And in that naked environment, those scars, that pain, that trauma was revealed. And she worked carefully with them, week after week, as she met with them. She raised her own children to be generous. She sewed mukluks and clothes for all those who were needy in her village and beyond. And she even told her children, if you ever see anybody wearing your own clothes, don't say anything because I've given them away to those who needed them. Her husband, for many years, did not go to church. But she prayed hard for him. She prayed hard for him and for his friends to the point where they began to come to church and to be readers. But because the, there was a great need for priests, there was a, a new seminary established in 1972 called St. Herman. And her husband was one of the first students there. In fact, of the eight students who began at St. Herman's in 1972, seven of them were from the village of Olga, of 250 people. And her husband was ordained. And so for the last six years of her life, Olga became Matushka Olga, as she is known, Mother Olga. She died in 1979 of cancer a cancer for which she had initially sought some treatment, but decided it was not necessary. She needed, rather than to be spending the rest of her life in the hospital in Anchorage, to be amidst her people. And the Lord spared her 
In the last couple of years of her life and gave her great and renewed energy despite her disease. And she served the people around her right until her death. Today, Matushka Olga is venerated as a saint by the Yupik people, by the wider Alaskan and now North American church. Her icons are painted and services are written for her. She's not officially glorified in, in terms of being recognized formally by the church, but that's not how it works. That's not how sainthood works. Saints are raised locally and only eventually recognized or given sort of wider distribution by a synod of bishops. And that day will come and we will have her feast day on the 8th of November, which is the day of her departure. But how did she become a saint? Remember, she baked crossroads. She made clothes. She talked to people and cared for people. She gave to those in need. She sang in the choir and learned the services of the church. She made sure the church was ready whenever a priest would be able to visit. She loved her husband and his friends into the church. And that's it. That's what makes a saint. That is the beautiful story of the local saints that we can't possibly imagine as being anything other than people who have just committed themselves to Christ and have given themselves up for him in their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. And her circumstances, okay, yes, in a small village in Alaska, it looks different from 21st century metropolitan Toronto. But her circumstances were meeting people who were in need, meeting people who had been traumatized and abused, meeting people for whom the church had nothing to say except that she learned to hear what they were saying and learned to reach out to them in their terms, to stand in solidarity with people who had been neglected or cast aside. All of those things pertain to us as well. How can we, in our life, do what she did? It's simple. The path before us is not a difficult one to walk. It simply requires our self-sacrifice and our love and our devotion to those around us. A further interesting part of her life is the fact that over her lifespan, Kef Luke developed quite substantially from those initial mud sub partly submerged huts that were traditional amongst the Yupik people. Houses came to be built, and there was a diesel generator and a school and an airport put in, a local airstrip. She saw all these changes. The dog sleds gave way to snowmobiles, and the traditional way of life of the Yupik people gradually was eroded. But she resisted that, and we depict her in icons wearing traditional Yupik garb and with the northern lights of, that were so sacred to her people, depicted as the, as the heavenly realm in the background. And she resisted. She fought hard to preserve the indigenous way of life. And how significant is it that today, which is only a few days after the National Day of Indigenous Peoples that we keep on every summer solstice now, where we reflect and we think about how it could be that that way of life wasn't one that needed to be obliterated in the name of progress and modernity. And it could be that people that naturally cared for one another and had community and who made the telling of stories from generation to generation a central feature of their life and living sustainably on the land in harmony with one another and with creation and ultimately with the Creator. Maybe there's something in that. And Olga shows us that too. So how significant is it we get a chance to commemorate her today? As I said, some hymns and uh, services have been written to her. So I'd like to close this morning by reading to you from uh, an akathis that has been composed in her honor by Father Lawrence Farley, who is the priest in our St. Herman's in uh, Langley, BC. Those abused from childhood know you as a mighty healer, O blessed Matushka. You appeared in a dream to one undergoing counseling for abuse, leading her through a forest, 
massaging her like a midwife so that all her years of painful trauma poured out from her, leaving her restored and joyful in spirit. Exulting in your healing love, we offer you these praises. Rejoice, companion of the Theotokos, granting us maternal protection. Rejoice, heir of St. Herman, shining forth from Alaska. Rejoice, you that straighten the tangled cords of the darkened past. Rejoice, you that give to the hurt and fallen a radiant future. Rejoice, for you dry the tears of children. Rejoice, for you drench us with the joy of Christ. Rejoice, peace for the traumatized. Rejoice, wholeness for the wounded. Rejoice, Matushka Olga, healer of the abused and broken. You labored in the far north as a new Tabitha, making clothes to shelter the poor from the cold and warming their souls with your love. We who endure the icy winds of this age also find shelter in your heavenly intercession and offer to you these praises. Rejoice, you that provided booths and parkas for the bodies of those in need. Rejoice, you that still provide God's grace for the souls of the afflicted. Rejoice, for your ceaseless labor clothed many throughout your village. Rejoice, for your glorious praises are sung by many throughout the world. Rejoice, strong consolation of peace for widows and orphans. Rejoice, invincible tower of defense for the crushed and despairing. Rejoice, haven of peace in the tumultuous world. Rejoice, silent witness to the eternal word. Rejoice, Matushka Olga, healer of the abused and broken. And the Treparian, by your righteous deeds, O holy Olga, you were revealed to the world as an image of the perfect servant of the Lord in Alaska. By your fasting and vigils and prayers, you were inspired in your evangelical life. You fed the hungry, you cared for the poor, you served as a midwife and you brought babies into the world. You nurtured children and you clothed all those in need. Now you stand at the right hand of Christ the Master and you intercede on behalf of us all. In the prayer, O blessed Matushka Olga, hear our prayer as we lift up our hearts to you, trusting in the power of your ceaseless intercession, even as you spread the warmth of your maternal love over the souls of the needy, abused and broken. So warm our souls also, healing our pain and bringing us the love of Christ. Through your prayers may we walk in the paths of peace, pleasing our Lord and glorifying his name, and so finally fail not to enter into the joy of his eternal kingdom, praising our God forever before his throne, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. 